Welcome back, Nick Landis Comic Corner, classic slash non-classic. This episode number 847, double shot number 741. Two Hulk trades by two different writers. Yeah, you'll find out the reason for that. First up, it is Hulk Falling One Banner DOA, and there's a tagline: Who shot Bruce Banner? That question is never answered in this particular story. Nope, it never is. It's not. This is basically like the first four issues of the 16 issues of Hulk Volume 3. This is written by Mark Waite and artwork by Mark Bagley. And this one is a bit of a reversal, where even when we had a change of writer for a few issues, we had the same artist for 16 issues. That's also a rarity we find nowadays. Aside from the whole thing of having the same creative team for a long period of time, how about, how about having an artist who stays in the same book for a long period of time? Look at Mark Bagley. It's one fantastic artist. Yep. Right after the events of Indestructible Hulk, at the end of issue 20, Bruce Banner gets shot in the head twice. Yep. And, of course, he gets, they perform emergency surgery on him. And these, these shady people, they don't reveal in this storyline who they are. They reveal that with the, with, the, with the succeeding writer. It's like Wade was just basically really want to be... Uh, he really wanted to leave this center after doing it for two years and just leaving it where the next writer basically would solve the question of who shot Bruce Banner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also I should point out, though, Maria Hill shows up in these issues, and after these issues, as off the top of my head, Maria Hill never reappears in this series ever again after this. I should point out these issues came out four years ago, and Maria Hill... Never returns this title ever again after this title is, after these issues are concluded. She doesn't show up in the succeeding writers' issues, or even Greg Pox issues. Not that I can think of, anyways. No, she never shows up for it. So this is the last official time you see Maria Hill in the pages of a Hulk comic. Also, the Hulk basically while trying to restore himself. Yeah, how the Hulk is sort of cured and of course his intelligence is briefly taken away. How is just restored thanks to a little little pill, a uh, little bean thing that's full of extremists. Yes, yeah, the same thing that Tony Stark had in his body from, I think it was like 2004 to I think it was like 2012. He had been by for eight years. Currently, Tony Stark does not have it in his body. Of course, this was all set up for the stuff that happened later. Yep. We also have return of Abomination in the storyline. Yeah, Abomination. His last known appearance prior to this was actually in a three-part tie-in for Chaos War by Greg Pak, which came out four years after the, before the storyline. Oh, and here's something a little something you might know. After these four issues, Abomination is never seen again. I'm not kidding. Despite the fact he's brought back as a zombie in here, he never returns. I mean, the, the next writer has nothing to do with him. Pac does nothing with Abomination. And Al Ewing might do something with Abomination. I don't know yet. His book is only about 10 issues in right now. It's really good. The Immortal Hulk is a fantastic title. I do highly recommend check it out. But yeah, Abomination disappears and never seen again. As for who are the people behind all this? Well, you're about to find out in the next trade. But I'll talk about what I have right here. This book is fantastic. Of course, this stuff will lead into... Original Sin, which my friend Edgar does not like the the crossover miniseries, the tie miniseries, the the, the Hulk versus Iron miniseries, which was written by Karen Gillian and Mark Wade, and also that particular miniseries was the the the, the end of both runs for both Karen Gillian's run for Iron Man and Mark Wade's one for Hulk. This book is really good, but it also features a uh, Arnold Stark. For the only time outside of a title, it was actually Arnold Stark's first appearance outside of an issue of Iron Man that he actually appeared. Of course, after this and the miniseries Hulk vs. Iron Man, Arnold Stark would never be seen again until toward the end of Brian Michael Bendis' run just this year. Yeah, he would disappear for four years before they finally make his epic return. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Arnold Stark doesn't do very much in here. He's just basically just a minor character. Yeah, but this, of course, is really good, and I do highly recommend people are fans of Hulk, and people are fans of Mark Wade's Run for Hulk. Get this book at 9.5 out of 10. Next up is the start of a brief status quo that only lasted for a year. This is 
Hulk Volume 2 Omega Hulk Book 1. This collects issues 5 through 10 of Hulk Volume 3 and the annual. Mm -hmm. This is written by Gary Duggan, who does all the issues in here. And the annual is not done by Duggan. Nope. This annual is done by Montanero. Mm -hmm. Mark Bagley is still doing the artwork. The cover art for this entire book is all these issues are done by these artists. Alex Ross, Gary Frank, Brad Anderson, Mark Bagley, obviously, Drew Hennessy, Jason Keith, or Mark Bagley, Drew, uh, uh, Nolan Wayward, and Mike Del Mundo. Mm -hmm. the, the, the artist who does the annual is Luke Frost, Le Blue, Le, Le, uh, Le Bell Underwood, Patrick Goddard, and Mark Leeming. Yeah. The Omega Hulk. Yeah, this is the start of the Doc Green storyline, which lasts until issue 16. Now, does does uh, Doc Green make, make an appearance outside of this title? Yes, and time runs out. He joins Luminati. Does the Hulk himself appear outside of this title? Oh, heck yes. He shows up in Access, where he develops another personnel they call Rolk, well, Cloak, and he's Basically an evil Hulk, where he basically beats the living crap out of the Sam like zone. He basically destroys his arm and smashes his helmet. Though he does, though that also features an appearance by Doc Green. One of his two appearances he made outside this title. Yeah, what's the whole? Now what happens in the storyline? Yeah, Doc Green, of course, recruits the scientists from the Mark Wade run. My guess is Wade. My, my guess is Doug him really must have loved these scientists so much that he brought them back for this storyline. Of course, they were absent for the last few issues, so he brought them back, and they're all working for him. Though he slowly gets rid of them one by one. One is actually I got rid of in the end. And that's actually Wolfman. Yeah, Patricia Wolfman. Yeah, she's gotten rid of via the fact she was turning on an island. Yep. As for the other woman, Lenderman. Yeah, she was one revealed to be the one who shot Bruce Banner. Now, who gave her the order to shoot Bruce Banner? Why, the Order of the Shield. Who the heck are they? They were an organization formed by Betty Ross to prevent the end of the world, and for some reason, she wanted to kill Bruce. She wanted to kill her ex-husband for some reason. Yeah, it's never told to explain why. Mm -hmm. And of course, Doc Green is on a mission to get rid of all the other gamma, all the gamma weapons. Oh yeah, there's also featured appearance here by Modok. Though what's Modok superior, not the original Modok. Yeah, the original Modok, uh, Jeff Loeb depowered him. And speaking of Jeff Loeb, one of one of the things he did during his run for Hulk from 2008 to 2010, a bomb. Yep. The first person that Doc Green goes after to cure people of their gamma radiation is a bomb, aka Rick Jones. Cures him, and then Rafty right cures him for a couple after it takes two issues. He then goes after Sakar, uh, Hulk's first son. Battles him for like one issue. At the end of the issue, he's cured. After that, he is never seen again for two years. He shows up again in Civil War II The Fall one-shot. And after that, he has not made parents since then. Mm-hmm. Of course, after he's depowered, he dropped up in Paris, and he's given a backpack full of money. Yeah, and it's also never explained where the heck that Doc Green gets all this money from. Yeah, apparently Doc Green has become rich. I mean, what did he do? Sell a bunch of inventions? It's never explained where the heck he gets all this money. Oh yeah, and his ritual based operations in here is a place called the Beehive. Though at the end of these issues, he gets transferred to the Baxter Building. Yeah, that's sort of a loose tie in that happens in Fantastic Four, the James Robinson run. And also, for some reason, part of the Baxter Building is destroyed. That portion of it. Yeah, the reason for that, you have to read Fantastic Four to understand what the heck was going on with that. Yeah, Fantastic Four got evicted from the building, but you have three Robinsons run to understand what the heck is going on with that. They don't, don't explain here... But they don't, they don't give an editorial note saying that you should read Fantastic Four to understand why he moved it, he had moved into the Baxter building. Yep. And then after he cures Sakar, he cures his ex, he cures Betty Ross. And he tells Betty Ross, Bruce Bear always loved her, no matter what she did. Mm -hmm. Then he goes after Betty Ross's father, General Ross, a.k.a. 
Red Hulk. Daredevil also makes appearance in here. Yeah, this is also a nod to something Wade did, where he made, where he had Bruce Banner hire Matt Murdock as his personal attorney. Really nice touch here. Yeah, and of course Daredevil asks like Doc Green, "Where's Bruce Banner?" Not here. And of course Betty, of course, is saddened by the apparent death of Bruce Banner. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, after the after her appearance in here. She also disappears for two years. Yeah, Betty Ross disappears for two years, and she also returns in Civil War II, The Fallen, which basically deals with the aftermath of Bruce Banner's death. Yep, as for Ross himself, he gets a he he and Red Doc Green gets into a fight, and he they try to cure him in here, but he doesn't get cured until later, along with the Gamma Corps. He goes out of the members. He also visits Hulkling. Yeah, he talks to him in a really good conversation, and he basically thought, thinks he's probably camera. And, and Hulkling explains, no, the reason why he's like this is because he's a half, he's a, I think he's half Cree, half Skrull, and he based his appearance on Hulk's appearance when he was much younger. And Doc Green doesn't have a problem with his appearance at all. He just tells him, don't use Gamma Ration. He's like, no problem, I won't use it. Now I think that was a cool. I think it was a cool thing Gary Duggan did that by having Doc Green meet up with Hulkling, who named himself after the Hulk. And of course, Doc Green has this weird thing of what he does. I'm not kidding. Where he insists whenever he whenever he transforms back and forth between Bruce Banner being the being well the Hulk, he insists on shaving his head into a mohawk. Yeah. As for why he does this. It's never explained because he's frequently seen shaving his head to this mohawk. Because when he turns into the Hulk, the hair grows back, so he has to sh takes time to shave it all off. As for why, I don't think Duncan ever explains that. Now, it's one of the biggest mysteries about this story. Like, why in the world does he shave his head? Yeah. The doc and also he gets a chance to visit briefly. Yeah, there's also even a connection to Brian Michael Bendis' run from Kenny X-Men. Yeah, this was particularly weird. Like, first, he he has a brief crossover with James Arbus' Fantastic Four, and then he has a cross... Well, actually, that happens after that, after this particular one. Yeah, we cross over with Brett Bendis' and Kenny X-Men. Well, this is after Battle for the Atom. Because Doc Ring goes to the Weapon X facility, punches the door, opens it to get Kitty Pryce, because she want, he wanted to use her phasing built to move the little thing in his head and he says Richards is away so call upon Kitty Pride to do this. Yep. And Cyclops who shows up and then she's like, uh what happened to the door? And Kitty Pride is like, that's a long story. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's great the fact Duggan gets a chance to visit by Michael Bendis' and Kenny X-Men run, which was being published at this point. And of course James Roberts is wearing Fantastic Four. Really nice indeed. Really good storyline. Yeah, and this this is a damn good storyline. I love this. This is fantastic. Now, as for getting rid of, well, undoing. Now, in the case of undoing stuff, getting rid of, now, the whole thing with Betty Ross being Red Shulk and uh, Rick Jones being A-Bomb, that was all Jeff Loeb. He's the one who, actually, no, even though Loeb was the one who set up the whole thing of Red Shield. He did create that particular character as a revelation of her being a Betty Ross. That was revealed in this issue written by Greg Pak. Yeah. So, Duncan just did something that Greg Pak did and Jeff Loeb with Betty Ross. In the case of A Bomb, that was Jeff Loeb. Mm -hmm. This book is fantastic. This book, a 9.5 out of 10. Really good. Got one more trade up to go for this. Yeah, and the whole thing with the annual, that's just basically Doc Green being a hero. Just saving saving a town, and it's a really nice little issue. Just too bad Doug didn't write it. Yeah, that's something really weird. Yeah, not many writers at Marvel had the tendency to... And this is basically in the last... Since I've been reading comic books, they don't really write their annuals. Usually it's a different person who writes the annuals. The only people I've seen who are regular writers who write their series annuals, uh, I know Matt Fraction did it with Hawkeye, and I know Bendis has done it too with his run for, I believe it was in Kenny X-Men, and I believe he did it for his run for Avengers. Yeah, he did it for that as well. 
Um, I don't think Hickman did it for his during his run for New Avengers. I don't believe he did. No, I don't believe he did. Mm -mm. So so far, I don't think I can think of who actually have done it. It just Bendis and Matt Fraction. Excuse me, and that's it when it comes to that. But this is good. And I can't wait to get my hands the final trade for this. And, of course, all-new X-Factor. And I've hustled up talking about that because this is just some really damn good stuff. And Duggan is one of those people I've never met. I've never met Duggan or Mark Bagley. I have met Mark Wade. Nice guy. When I met him, anyways. I heard he's very controversial now because he apparently is involved in a lawsuit over some stuff he said and the fact he uh, threatened to bring down a small... Uh, a small combo company. Yeah, I'm not going to get into it. I don't know much about this lawsuit. I don't care about it. Yeah. But Wade is good when he writes comic books. Currently, Wade does just Doctor Strange. That's the only book I can think of he currently does. He did do the Ant-Man and the Wasp miniseries, but that's over. So currently, the only book he writes right now is Doctor Strange. Duggan does Infinity Wars. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's the book he's doing now, is, is the Infinity Wars crossover that's publishing right now. Uh, Bagley, as far as I remember, I don't think he's on any books right now. No, I can't think of any books in right now. Not thinking of any of them anyways. Yeah, so that's it for this particular review. I have no other videos planned for today anyways. I was hoping to think of doing a review for Fairy Tale, but that's not going to happen because I didn't see it upload today. Probably tomorrow. Probably get a chance to do it. That along with Black Clover... And, of course, Seven Deadly Sins. So, three videos, hopefully, for tomorrow. Maybe more. Okay? But until you see the next few. Bye.